Thank you. I'll start with that. Let's talk about why you only have 10 days of credit. Actually, I'm waiting on credit uh, as of right now. Oh, my paperwork was submitted. I finished, I finished two classes and I'm waiting on a good time to be calculated. Uh, I was currently in the STR program. So it's just a, it's a waiting process right now. I, I finished the classes. I was just waiting on the calculation. So you, you've done some programs. They just haven't put it in the computers yet. Yes, sir. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your history. All of your charges and most of your charges are drug related. Tell me about your drug use. Well, I started uh, drinking first, then using marijuana. And uh, eventually, how old off, were you? It's about 14, 15. Okay. Then I, then I ventured off into heroin, which led my back and forth to incarceration. You know, and, uh, when did you start using heroin? Around 17. All right. And uh, that, would, that, you know, that would lead to my back and forth incarceration, just dealing with that addiction. And, you know, you know, just, just, just a constant, well, just a constant battle. It, it looks like uh, your first arrest, at least what I show, is uh, ninety-five. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, drug related. Uh, you've been arrested on a number of occasions. You've been supervised three times. Two of them have been revoked, and your last one was terminated unsatisfactorily. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Tell me what's changed or what's different now about you. Who's to say that that we don't let you out today? You come back. You don't do very well on supervision. Tell me why you believe you'll do better on supervision this time. What what I what I what I came to understand is uh, I, I can't use no mood altering substance. That that's 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 my that's that's my downfall, and uh, you know I accepted a way of life, but I, I can't use no mood altering substance. So I know I have to get in the program and stick with it. I have to get me a, a sponsor, and I just you know and just stay focused. You know, one day at a time. I have to have supervision. I I need that hope and that encouragement. I I need that structure. To like, well, to like, when you were structured, when you were structured and supervised, you performed poorly. You were revoked. You got new arrests, uh, and you were terminated unsatisfactorily. What about what you've gone through will change that? Going through the STAR program, it helped me acknowledge a lot of things I had I, I didn't deal with within myself. It made me, you know, accept, you know, uh, things I've been harboring, which was was incorrect thinking. Tell me about the incorrect. Tell me about your incorrect thinking. I, I twisted right and wrong up. I, I, I literally twist right and wrong up, you know. And the program really helped me, you know, sort those things out. A lot of, you know, uh, perspectives I had was totally off, and I was living that out. So when things came up against me, I went back, you know, my, my, my thinking was already wrong. So I went back to it, you know, but this program. Now, now you, you came before the parole board in November of last year. Yes, sir. And at that time you were denied because of lack of programs and there were some law enforcement objections. It was suggested that you do substance abuse anger management, and a few other things. Now, since then, you've done the STARS program. You enrolled in STARS? Yes, sir. What other programs were you enrolled in? Living in Balance, Job Life Skills, and Substance Abuse. And those are the ones that haven't been put yet into the computer? Yes, sir. Back in 2012, I'm sorry, 95, in 95, uh, it looks like you pled guilty to possession with intent to distribute cocaine and you were put on active supervised probation and a special condition 
was to do the drum court. Did you do that at all? I believe I started because I, I, if I can relate, remember, I had to pay fines. So I, I know I started it. Like I said, I got, you know, I started using heroin again and I, I drifted off. But I know I started it because I had to pay fines, if I can remember. How long were you, how long were you using heroin and how often? It was an everyday struggle for, you know, for a few years. How many friends do you know that have died as a result of heroin overdoses? I didn't know a lot. Since incarceration, I didn't, I didn't heard of a lot of people that died. A lot. You realize you could certainly be one of them. Yes, sir. How are you going to be able to control your addiction if you get out? I have to stick with a program. I have to, I know they have one at the church I attend. I have to stick with a program. I have to keep my faith-based initiative. I have to, you know, that, and that's the only way I know on a day-to-day -day basis I'm, I'm able to stay sane. I got to stick with my, my faith. I have to stick with support groups because it's, it's working. It's working. I ain't picking up. One day at a time, I'm not picking up. It's working. Tell me a little bit about your conduct while you've been in prison. When was the last time you had a write-up? It was in uh, in 2018. Okay. And what was that for? It was a uh, rule for a rule for local write-up. Uh, I was in a commissary in a. Uh, the officer was calling my name and I didn't hear her. And one thing led to another. It was like, so, you know, she just told me to you just, just leave because I, I didn't hear my name, my name being called. So I just asked, I just left. You're currently a cha uh, an orderly in the chapel? Yes, sir. How long have you been doing? Since I've been in DCI for about a year, almost a year. You're also a pride member, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you're a member of Kairos? Yes, sir. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, Kairos was a beautiful experience. Actually, you know, it, it really helped me uh, experience love inside incarceration. You know, it, it, really, it really did and helped me come to terms with forgiveness. You know, so I, I really, that's another program I would like to stick with too. Cairo's been a, it been a, it been a, it been a help. A big you, help. You've indicated, you, you indicated a, a little while ago, a few minutes ago, while you and I were talking, that you really need the support. Do you believe that you can fight this addiction alone? No, I need help. No. Do you go to AA meetings or have you gone to any sort of meetings while you've been in prison? Yes, I go to AA and NA. And uh, I was, you know, I'm currently in a, a STAR program and those programs help, they help. Tell me what you get out of the AA meetings. Strength from each other. You know, the openness, the willingness to change one day at a time. You know, it's, it's really, you know, is uh you get strength from them. You get strength from each other. What are what are what are some of your addiction triggers? I believe my surroundings, my surroundings played a factor. My surroundings played a big factor. You know, you know, and, and, a, and you have, you, and a people. you're going to be living with your mother if uh, you get released? Yes, sir. In New Orleans? Yes. And you have a job with Gibson's Electrical Services? Yes, sir. 
Do you have experience uh, working? What is your work experience? Uh, I'm a journeyman right now doing electrical work. That's one of my goals to get my license when I, if I do get the chance to get out. To give me, to get now, did, you, did you learn that skill in prison or did you have that skill when you came in? I had that skill when I came in. So you're a journeyman electrician? Yes, sir. Tell me why I should give you a chance and vote to release you early. Just in about a minute, very short. I, I, I believe in, and I know in my heart that I can be productive in society. I can contribute. I don't mind working. I'm, I, I don't mind helping. I can be, a, I mean, I can be an asset to society. I, 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 you know, I, I made some mistakes and, uh, you know, I'm ready to be the man God created me to be out there. I mean, just one day at a time. That's, that's all I can do. The best that I can do, God enabled me to do one day at a time. Take care. Thank you time. very much, sir. Ms. Wise. Uh, I want to hear from the, uh, the institution before I ask my question. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Assistant Warden Bruce Costin. Uh, I can say that uh, Chase On is one of our better offenders. And uh, just piggybacking off what he said, uh, he did receive a low code write up, which is a disobedient, and he only got uh, two weeks uh, no use of telephone. So uh, I think that was pretty good. Uh, he hadn't had no write up since 2018. And uh, he is a pride member, a program that we offer uh, when you don't have a write up within a year time. So you become a pride member. And uh, as he said, he also have a certificate in Cairo's inside weekend program. He completed that, uh, the STAR program, uh, criminal addiction. He did complete that with a certificate. And uh, also as well as the participation in the six month AANA, which he has a certificate in that. And uh, he also have a certificate in the gospel. According to John, 16 weeks American Bible, society so he completed that as well as the uh one year kingdom character program so uh with that being said uh he, like i said he's one hour better offender and i believe that if he given the opportunity uh he will be an access to society all right thank you warden thank you uh mr how much time have you served Almost eight years. Almost eight years. Okay. Uh, and you you said something about the STAR program. Are you in the STAR program or have you completed the STAR program? I'm pretty much completed. I've been in there four months. The way the program is, by me, by, by me not really being sent out by the parole board, it was like, I'm in the class, but I don't officially have a timeline on when it's completed. Am I making sense? Nope. Most oh, okay. Most guys that go in there go with the with the recommendation from the parole board, so okay. they they got a timeline on how long they stay. Yeah, it's six to nine months. It's six to nine months. What they tell us to tell them. Right, right, right. So by me going as a. Uh, Pretty much, you know, a offender of already, you know, not recommended. I was in there for four months already. So you a volunteer? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, and have they made any suggestions to you about what you need to do to stay clean and sober at release? Yes, yes, they made some suggestions. Can you tell me what they are? Uh, like I said, we, we, we often talk, you know, they, they, she, you know, she showed us about addictive thinking, criminal thinking, how to change it around. And, uh, you know, it, it's, she, you know, the program really helped me, you know, 
write a journal and, and really get inside myself and deal with those things I had hidden and open them and be honest with myself. And uh, also we talked about the Vivitrol injection, you know, which is, you know, which is helpful. Uh, is that something they're going to recommend for you or what? Yes. Uh, you've had an injection? No, ma'am. Okay. Oh, that's all I had, Chairman. Mr. Shasso. Yes, sir. I'm going to be very honest with you. I have two concerns. First concern is you've been incarcerated for eight years and you wait until the parole board denies you for an early release to start taking programs. Why didn't you start taking programs from the very first day you were incarcerated? Actually, I started taking programs maybe around 2015 because I was in Winfield Correctional Center. Okay. And, and the classes were limited. They didn't have too many classes. All they had was a lot of faith-based. And I participated in all the faith-based classes. I was a mentor in the faith-based. So I did, you know, I, I did everything that was allowed to me at the camp. Then I came to DCI and, you know, I, 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 I got in everything here. Okay. You've been in some pretty bad places. Winfield, Riverbend, okay. I see it. Now, my other concern, have you taken a class called Cage Your Rage? Yes, I started it, yes. Have you completed it? No, I, I, I started it at East Carroll. From East okay. Carroll, I came to Dixie. So before you had a chance to complete that class, you got transferred. Yes, sir. I was almost finished. Then they shipped me to DCI. With, with, with the violent offenses that you have on your record and the firearm charges that you have on your record, I'm not going to vote to release you until you have anger management. Warden, are you still, um, are classes still going on? No, no, sir, not at this time. Due to the, so no, uh, no anger management, uh, just no, no good time classes right now? No, sir. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, Mr. Chair. So, yes, sir. I, I'm going to, Rely upon Judge um, Mr. Mar Marabella to give me some guidance. And but you will take anger management before you release or soon after you release. Yes, sir. Because if you are released, anger management. It will be required as a condition of your parole. Okay. 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 If there's no more questions, uh, we've had remarks from the warden. It's time for you to make a final statement. Uh, I think uh, if you're given an opportunity. Uh, well, no, 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 warden. It's time for uh, Mr. Chase on, okay, Chase on. Okay, I, I, I just pray for, for another chance. You know, like I said, to be the man God created me to be in society. You know, I, I understand I made some bad decisions. You know, I understand I, I can't use any mood altering substance. I have to stay focused. I have to, you know, stick to my support groups. I have to, you know, continue to take care of my family. You know, I, I don't mind working. I don't mind working, I don't mind helping. 
you know, I know I can be productive and, and you know, you know, stand strong and be the man God created me to be, you know, one day at a time. Thank you. You're welcome. Are we, are we ready to vote? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, Mr. Mayor Bella. Mr. Chasson, uh, I've reviewed uh, your the record. Uh, obviously, uh, you have had a serious heroin problem for a long time. Uh, I am uh, cognizant of Mr. Roche's questions and very good questions. And that is, you know, why did you wait until the parole board told you, hey, you should be taking these classes? You know, uh, you should have been doing that all along. But, you know, sometimes we start late. Sometimes we got to be hit over the head with a board before we pay attention. Apparently, the parole board got your attention. And it sounds like from the program, the STARS program that you've been working on, you've gotten a lot out of it. It's been very beneficial to you. Uh, it's impressive to me that uh, you're a pride member. Uh, I am familiar. I've never been involved in it, but I'm familiar with the Kairos program. Uh, I've had students at the law school who volunteered to work at that program. It's an excellent program, and I'm very pleased to see that you worked in that program. Uh, you have a good recommendation letter from your chaplain. The warden has given you a good recommendation. Uh, you have a good employment plan set up for you. Uh, I do share, however, uh, Mr. Roche's concerns about anger management. Uh, I do want to see you take an anger management program. Uh, based upon all of those things, based upon your actions, based upon the programs that you've taken, I am going to vote to grant uh, a parole to you with the following special conditions. Number one, uh, that you continue, that you obtain and continue your substance abuse treatment. I want you to get an evaluation and follow whatever treatment is recommended by them. I want you to, to uh, attend three AA meetings per week for the first six months. I also want you to be under a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, only exceptions would be for work. Uh, church or other conditions of your parole supervision. Uh, I'm also going to uh, require order that you get a substance abuse evaluation. I mean, not a substance, that you attend an anger management class. They've got several types of anger management classes. I'm not talking about a one hour thing. I'm talking about a fairly significant anger management program that your parole officer will be able to assist you and recommend to you. Now, you mentioned Vivitrol, the potential of Vivitrol injections. Uh, Vivitrol may very well be something that ultimately you may need. I do not want you to take that upon yourself. I want you to make sure that if in fact that is recommended for you, it's absolutely with the knowledge and awareness of your parole officer. Do you understand? Yes, sir. All right. That would be my vote. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. Um, Mrs. Wise. Uh, sir, I, um, I concur with Mr. Marabella. My uh, vote is to grant for the reasons and on the condition that he already stated. But for the first four weeks, I want you to report weekly to your probation and parole officer. For the first four weeks, that is my vote. Thank you. Mr. Chasso. Yes, sir. You have received two votes to grant your request. I too will agree with my colleagues this afternoon, and I will grant that request with the following conditions. 
First of all, you have a you have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. You must enroll in an anger management program upon release. Not a class, not a one time for all. You must enroll in a program. Get with your parole officer. He will have places and times where you can enroll. You probably will have to do this at your own expense. Okay. You must attend NAAA meetings at least three times a week. You must have a substance abuse evaluation and follow all recommendations. Was, is that one of your conditions, Mr. Maribel? Yes, it was. Okay. And I'm going to add that you have random drug screens at the discretion of your parole officer. And the last one was added by Ms. Wise that you report to your parole officer weekly for the first four weeks. Is that right, Ms. Wise? Do you understand? Ooh, that's correct. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. You have received three votes to grant your request. Your request for early release has been granted. You have a Thank good day. You. Thank you, sir. Well, what do you think? Do you think that uh, he really only started to take those programs because he knew about parole or because they weren't available? It was interesting to see that that's what Mr. Roche may have found consensus on, but Mr. Mirabella with the reference of sometimes you got to get hit over the head with the board uh, before you can start taking the programs. Um, I love that Mr. Mirabella had this case and it's so sad that he is not coming back. Uh, but we're still meeting new parole board members. And if you haven't met any of them yet, you're going to meet one now because guess who's back? He is back. Um, now this hearing that we just watched took place mid 2020 and he picked up a new charge as of September 9, 2023. Uh, it says domestic abuse, aggravated assault, possession of, uh, Codex looks like. So we're going to see him at a revocation hearing. Um, now, March 20th is when it took place, 2024. So let's jump in. Good afternoon, sir. Good morning. Good afternoon. Could you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number. I have Chase on. My number is 359145. All right, sir, and I think you're represented by counsel. Mr. S would you introduce yourself for the record, sir? Yes, my name is Jeffrey Smith, and I am the attorney and have been the attorney for Edmund Chesson since his arrest. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we also have your mother, Ms. Warren Chesson, who would like to speak, and we'll ask her to do so at the appropriate time. Is she with you, Mr. Smith? Yes, she is sitting okay. next to me at my office. Thank okay. you. So, uh, Mr. Chesson, you're accused of violating the conditions of your parole. I'm going to read the allegations against you. I'm going to ask you to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. We'll have a conversation about that. Uh, then we'll hear, once we finish with our questions, we'll hear from your mother. You'll be allowed to make a statement, and then we're going to turn it over to Mr. Smith for his presentation before we go, okay? You're accused of violating the conditions of your parole, specifically condition number four, and it states you engaged in criminal activity on August 16, 2023, when you committed the crimes of domestic abuse, aggravated assault, aggravated assault in possession of a firearm or carrying a, a concealed weapon by a convicted felon as evidenced by your arrest by the NOPD August 28, 2023. On November 30th, 2023, you pled guilty to aggravated assault with a dangerous weapon and illegal carrying of a weapon. And, and uh, how do you plead to violating condition number four? 
not guilty. Okay, then, and then there's condition number five. <clears throat> you had in your presence or control a firearm on around August 16, 2023, when you committed the crimes of domestic abuse, aggravated assault, aggravated assault and possession of a firearm, carrying of an, a concealed weapon by a convicted felon. As evidenced by your arrest by NOPD on August 28, 2023. How do you plead to violating condition number five? Thank you. All right, sir. You want to tell us what happened? Uh, me and my girlfriend had an argument. I gave her some money to purchase an automobile. And when I went to purchase it, she was supposed to put the cash on the debit card. When I went to purchase the, the automobile, the debit card didn't work. When I brought it back to her, I mean, she just went ballistic on me. When I told her the money didn't clear, she just she didn't want, she went ballistic on me. At that time, I called my mother and I just left the scene. Now, prior to that, me and her been having, you know, we was on rock, we was on rock, we was on rock position. But you know, I mean, that was it. I left the scene. Um, so you, but you pled guilty to aggravated assault. Uh, in, in carrying of an illegal weapon, what was the weapon? There wasn't no weapon. I never got any weapon. Why I, you? I, I took the I took the charge because you know, through the abuse of my lawyer and the parole officer said if I take a misdemeanor, I can go home. But I never got caught with no weapon. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't have pled because because the information you were provided was inaccurate. Um, so how long have you you've been in jail? Seven months. Seven months. And the the client the complainant or the victim in this case is Samantha Massey. Yes, my girlfriend. And she claims you fired a couple of shots at her. Right. All right. Um, I tell you what. I don't see any other questions so we're going to hear from your mother uh mrs warren chasson we'd like to hear from her name uh ma'am yes sir is, is it i think i can clear up so much the mother is to talk about in the event that he was put on parole he would live with her but huh. i have so much more information about this case that i think is really important All right well uh we'd like to hear from you then now's the time Okay, so this case, he was arrested. And in fact, I went to the home with the police because they had a search warrant to look for a weapon. No weapon was ever recovered. There's been no evidence of a weapon. When it reached section L, right from the get-go, the DAs were trying to say that this was a very weak case, wouldn't give me the total information so I went and talked to Pierre Hardnett, and I said to him, the state doesn't want to prosecute him for these charges. What can we do to resolve this as quickly as possible to get him home? Pierre Hardnett told me, and he won't deny it, he said, any felony conviction will get his parole revoked. Any, 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 A-N-Y, any misdemeanor, we will not revoke him. So I went to the judge, Judge Harris, I went to the DA, and I told them exactly what Pierre Hardin had told me. And they said, that's not a problem because we don't think we can really go forward with this case. We'll give you a misdemeanor. So I called Pierre Hardin and I said, he's gonna plead guilty to a misdemeanor. I asked him, does it matter what it is? He said, as long as it's not a felony. So, and I don't think he was doing this with any mal intent. I think that's what he thought was the truth. So I went back to them and they said, we'll give him a 1495, a possession of a firearm, that's it. And I told them he didn't have a firearm. And they said, well, if your information is correct, he'll stay on parole. The judge wants to give him probation. And I sent all of you, I emailed it to you, the actual plea, which was not really on the 30th, it happened two weeks later because the judge changed everything. 
So the judge said, I want to put him on probation six months and I want him to do inactive probation and I want him to do drug and alcohol treatment because I think he needs that. So everything was fine. We did the plea. She said, I want him to come back in two weeks so we can discuss his probation to see if he's enrolled in inpatient, outpatient, whatever we need to do. And everybody was left very happy with the situation. I called Pierre and told him, okay, I got the misdemeanor, it's done. When does he get out of jail? Pierre said, it might be a few days. Then Pierre called me back and said, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, I had the wrong information. Apparently a misdemeanor would have been fine, but this was a gun. And so that's almost like a felony and they want to do a parole hearing. And I was, you know, I've been doing this 43 years and I've never had this happen to me before, but I felt terrible because I could have just gone to trial. And I think very confidently from what I've talked to the DA and the judge about, I would have could have waived a jury. He would have been found not guilty. But I told the judge right after this happened, what happened? So the judge actually told me, well, what's the problem? I said, well, one of the problems is when he did the plea, he actually was asked, are you pleading guilty because you are guilty? And so that could be used against him. And he never had the gun. So she said, file a motion to withdraw the plea. I then filed a motion to withdraw the plea. And you have the whole transcript in front of you. And then I went back. And if I'm, I'm looking right now, in fact, the plea was done on 1130. And then I filed my motion to with, you know, withdraw the plea. And we went back on 1211. And on 1211, he did a second plea. And I'm looking at the transcript on that. And in that case, the judge said, we're going to do the plea under Alfred versus North Carolina, where it literally says, you're not pleading guilty because you are guilty. You're pleading guilty because it's in your best interest. And so it even started off with the judge said, we're going back, entering pleas to the same counts that you did last time. And then she talked about Alfred and she actually said, um, and you've had a conversation, this is the judge speaking. You've had a conversation with your attorney about conversations that he had with your parole officer. Is that correct? Yes. And it was your understanding that if you pled guilty to misdemeanors that you would not be revoked on your parole. Yes. And you're, and you're entering pleas of guilt to these charges because it's in your best interest. Yes. Um, and it goes on and on where the judge keeps, um, on the, and she says, uh, on page seven, and on the new plea form, there is something that is written on the bottom. Did you write this? Yes. And in the bottom, it says, this plea is taken under North Carolina versus Alfred. Mr. Chesson is not admitting guilt. He is pleading to three misdemeanors because his parole officer, Pierre Hardinet, told his attorney that it would be violated only for felony convictions and that this would be a technical violation not resulting in revocation. The judgment factor relied on this information in requiring Mr. Chesson to enroll in an outpatient drug and alcohol program. And then did you sign that form? Um, and um, and she, the judge did say, just to be clear, no one assured you that you would not be violated on your parole if you enter the pleas today for the three misdemeanors. And, you know, he, he said he understood that. And so the bottom line is, is he would never have pled guilty to anything had we thought his par parole would be violated. And I, and I, you know, I, what can I say? 43 years, I talked to parole officers, I don't know, hundreds of times, and this has never happened before. If Pierre had told me, Jeffrey, any misdemeanor involving a gun, then we would have just said, we're going to go to trial. And from my talks to the DA, eventually this case would have just been no pros. However, we wanted to get him in home. He has a job. His boss was keeping his job open for him. I sent a letter to you also, which you should have in front of you from uh, Damon Gibson, he's an electrician, and he has offered his same job as an electrician. Um, you know, I, it just, I just, this is the first time I can say in 43 years, I, I relied on the parole officer's information. Had he but, told me from the get-go, it never would have happened. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Okay, why didn't you let him withdraw his plea when you went back in December? Mm -hmm. 
I no, we the didn't. judge told you at the end that he could be revoked, and he said he understood. Because we all felt that the best thing to do was simply say that it was in his best interest to plead guilty, it's not, not, not because he's guilty, under Alfred versus North Carolina. And okay. if we would have waited and gone to trial, just telling you from my experience in the building, it might have been another year before we would have got to trial. It's just, I mean, I'm trying cases now that are three years old. So to get him home would have taken probably at least a year to have a trial. And Thank so you. the fastest way we thought would be to just enter. And let me say this, uh, the district attorney made every representation that the alleged victim did not want to testify. And I believe it's because she didn't want to perjure herself. I didn't make a big deal about it, but um, I didn't want her to have to go to jail for filing a false police report. They never found a gun. There was no evidence of, I never saw ballistics of a gun fired. I didn't see any of that. So, um, and when I offered the misdemeanor, they immediately, and if you look at the uh, docket master, they jumped on it. They literally, and trust me, I do this every day I'm in that building. I know every judge, every prosecutor, had they thought that a weapon was used, they never would have so quickly offered a misdemeanor and then had no objection to redoing it again, where he then officially said, I am not guilty. I'm pleading guilty because it's in my best interest. Okay, Mr. Smith, thank you. We, we definitely uh, hear your message and I'm gonna make a motion that we go into executive session to discuss confidential matters. All those uh, details that you just mentioned to us were, were uh, obviously a late submittal and just uploaded this morning to our, our records. I have not had time to look at them. Uh, so Amen. soon as I will be there uh, in executive, well, I need a roll call executive session. So yeah, we're gonna exactly. go in. But can I just yes. tell you one thing really quickly? I had emergency gallbladder surgery. This all would have gotten to you last week. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, but I, I was Mr. Smith, we'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. Okie doke. Good afternoon, sir. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number. I have Chase on. My number is 359145. All right, sir. And I think you're represented by counsel. Mr. Would you introduce yourself for the record, sir? Yes, my name is Jeffrey Smith, and I am the attorney and have been the attorney for Edmund Chasson since his arrest. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we also have your mother, Ms. Warren Chasson, who would like to speak, and we'll ask her to do so at the appropriate time. Is she with you, Mr. Smith? Yes, she is okay. sitting next to me at my office. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Chasson, you're accused of violating the conditions of your parole. I'm going to read the allegations against you. I'm going to ask you to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. We'll have a conversation about that. Uh, then we'll hear, once we finish with our questions, We'll hear from your mother. You'll be allowed to make a statement, and then we're going to turn it over to Mr. Smith for his presentation before we go, okay? You're accused of violating the conditions of your parole, specifically condition number four, and it states, you engaged in criminal activity on August 16, 2023, when you committed the crimes of domestic abuse, aggravated assault, aggravated assault and possession of a firearm, or carrying a, a concealed weapon by a convicted felon as evidenced by your arrest by the NOPD August 28, 2023. On November 30th, 2023, you pled guilty to aggravated assault with a dangerous weapon and illegal carrying of a weapon. In, in, uh, how do you plead to violating condition number four? Not guilty. Okay, then, and then there's condition number five. <clears throat> you had in your presence or control a firearm on or around August 16, 2023, when you committed the crimes of domestic abuse, aggravated assault, aggravated assault and possession of a firearm, carrying of an e a concealed weapon by a convicted felon. As evidenced by your arrest by NOPD on August 28, 2023, how do you plead to violating condition number five? 
Thank you. All right, sir, you want to tell us what happened? Uh, me and my girlfriend had an argument. I gave her some money to purchase an automobile. And when I went to purchase it, she was supposed to put the cash on the debit card. When I went to purchase the, the automobile, the debit card didn't work. When I brought it back to her, I mean, she just went ballistic on me. When I told her the money didn't clear up, she just she didn't want, she went ballistic on me. At that time, I called my mother and I just left the scene. Now, prior to that, me and her been having, you know, we was on rocking, we was on rocking, we was on rocking position. But, you know, I mean, that was it. I left the scene. Well, so you, but you pled guilty to aggravated assault uh in, in carrying of an illegal weapon. What was the weapon? There wasn't no weapon. I never got the weapon. I, you, I, I took the I took the charge because you know, through the due to my lawyer and the parole officer said if I take a misdemeanor I can go home. But I never got caught with the weapon. Yeah. You shouldn't have pled because because the information you were provided was inaccurate. Um, so how long have you you've been in jail? Seven months. Seven months. And the the client the complainant or the victim in this case is Samantha Massey. Yes, my girlfriend. And she claims you fired a couple of shots at her. That's right. All right. Um, I tell you what. I don't see any other questions so we're going to hear from your mother uh mrs warren chasson we'd like to hear from her name um uh, ma'am yes sir is, is it i think i can clear up so much the mother is to talk about in the event that he was put on parole he would live with her but oh. i have so much more information about this case that i think is really important All right well uh we'd like to hear from you then now's the time Okay, so this case, he was arrested. And in fact, I went to the home with the police because they had a search warrant to look for a weapon. No weapon was ever recovered. There's been no evidence of a weapon. When it reached section L, right from the get-go, the DAs were trying to say that this was a very weak case, wouldn't give me the total information so I went and talked to Pierre Hardnett, and I said to him, the state doesn't want to prosecute him for these charges. What can we do to resolve this as quickly as possible to get him home? Pierre Hardnett told me, and he won't deny it, he said, any felony conviction will get his parole revoked. Any, 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 A-N-Y, any misdemeanor, we will not revoke him. So I went to the judge, Judge Harris, I went to the DA, and I told them exactly what Pierre Hardin had told me. And they said, that's not a problem because we don't think we can really go forward with this case. We'll give you a misdemeanor. So I called Pierre Hardin and I said, he's gonna plead guilty to a misdemeanor. I asked him, does it matter what it is? He said, as long as it's not a felony. So, and I don't think he was doing this with any mal intent. I think that's what he thought was the truth. So I went back to them and they said, we'll give him a 1495, a possession of a firearm, that's it. And I told them he didn't have a firearm. And they said, well, if your information is correct, he'll stay on parole. The judge wants to give him probation. And I sent all of you, I emailed it to you, the actual plea, which was not really on the 30th it happened two weeks later because the judge changed everything so the judge said i want to put him on probation six months and i want him to do inactive probation and i want him to do drug and alcohol treatment because i think he needs that so everything was fine we did the plea she said i want him to come back in two weeks so we can discuss his probation to see if he's enrolled in inpatient outpatient whatever we need to do and everybody was left very happy with the situation. I called Pierre and told him, okay, I got the misdemeanor, it's done. When does he get out of jail? 
Pierre said, it might be a few days. Then Pierre called me back and said, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, I had the wrong information. Apparently a misdemeanor would have been fine, but this was a gun. And so that's almost like a felony and they want to do a parole hearing. And I was, you know, I've been doing this 43 years and I've never had this happen to me before, but I felt terrible because I could have just gone to trial. And I think very confidently from what I've talked to the DA and the judge about, I would have could have waived a jury. He would have been found not guilty. But I told the judge right after this happened, what happened? So the judge actually told me, well, what's the problem? I said, well, one of the problems is when he did the plea, he actually was asked, are you pleading guilty? Because you are guilty. And so that could be used against him. And he never had the gun. So she said, file a motion to withdraw the plea. I then filed a motion to withdraw the plea. And you have the whole transcript in front of you. And then I went back. And if I'm, I'm looking right now, in fact, the plea was done on 1130. And then I filed my motion to with, you know, withdraw the plea. And we went back on 1211. And on 1211, he did a second plea. And I'm looking at the transcript on that. And in that case, the judge said, we're going to do the plea under Alfred versus North Carolina, where it literally says, you're not pleading guilty because you are guilty. You're pleading guilty because it's in your best interest. And so it even started off with the judge said, we're going back entering pleas to the same counts that you did last time. And then she talked about Alfred and she actually said, um, and you've had a conversation, this is the judge speaking. You've had a conversation with your attorney about conversations that he had with your parole officer. Is that correct? Yes. And it was your understanding that if you played guilty to misdemeanors that you would not be revoked on your parole. Yes. And you're, and you're entering pleas of guilt to these charges because it's in your best interest. Yes. Um, and it goes on and on where the judge keeps, um, on the, and she says, uh, on page seven, and on the new plea form, there is something that is written on the bottom. Did you write this? Yes. And in the bottom, it says, this plea is taken under North Carolina versus Alfred. Mr. Chesson is not admitting guilt. He is pleading to three misdemeanors because his parole officer, Pierre Hardinet, told his attorney that it would be violated only for felony convictions and that this would be a technical violation not resulting in revocation. The judgment factor relied on this information in requiring Mr. Chesson to enroll in an outpatient drug and alcohol program. And then did you sign that form? Um, and um, and, she, and the judge did say, just to be clear, no one assured you that you would not be violated on your parole if you enter the pleas today for the three misdemeanors. And, you know, he, he said he understood that. And so the bottom line is, is he would never have pled guilty to anything had we thought his par parole would be violated. And I, and I, you know, I, what can I say? 43 years, I talked to parole officers, I don't know, hundreds of times. And this has never happened before. If Pierre had told me, Jeffrey, any misdemeanor involving a gun, then we would have just said, we're going to go to trial. And from my talks to the DA, eventually this case would have just been no prost. However, we wanted to get him in home. He has a job. His boss was keeping his job open for him. I sent a letter to you also, which you should have in front of you from uh, Damon Gibson, he's an electrician, and he has offered his same job as an electrician. Um, you know, <laughs> I, it just, I just, this is the first time I can say in 43 years, I, I relied on the parole officer's information. Had he but, told me from the get-go, it never would have happened. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Okay, why didn't you let him withdraw his plea when you went back in December? Mm -hmm. I did, know what the did. judge told you at the end that he could be revoked. And he said he understood. Because we all felt that the best thing to do was simply say that it was in his best interest to plead guilty. It's not, not, not because he's guilty under Alfred versus North Carolina. And okay. if we would have waited and gone to trial, just telling you from my experience in the building, it might have been another year before we would have got to trial. It's just, I mean, I'm trying cases now that are three years old. 
So to get him home would have taken probably at least a year to have a trial. And Thank so you. the fastest way we thought would be to just enter. And let me say this, uh, the district attorney made every representation that the alleged victim did not want to testify. And I believe it's because she didn't want to perjure herself. I didn't make a big deal about it, but um, I didn't want her to have to go to jail for filing a false police report. They never found a gun. There was no evidence of, I never saw ballistics of a gun fired. I didn't see any of that. So, um, and when I offered the misdemeanor, they immediately, and if you look at the uh, docket master, they jumped on it. They literally, and trust me, I do this every day I'm in that building. I know every judge, every prosecutor, had they thought that a weapon was used, they never would have so quickly offered a misdemeanor and then had no objection to redoing it again, where he then officially said, I am not guilty. I'm pleading guilty because it's in my best interest. Okay, Mr. Smith, thank you. We, we definitely uh, hear your message and I'm gonna make a motion that we go into executive session to discuss confidential matters. All those uh, details that you just mentioned to us were, were uh, obviously a late submittal and just uploaded this morning to our, our records. I have not had time to look at them. Uh, so Amen. soon as I will be there uh, in executive, well, I need a roll call executive session. So yeah, we're gonna exactly. go in. But can I just yes. tell you one thing really quickly? I had emergency gallbladder surgery. This all would have gotten to you last week. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, but I, I was operating. Mr. Smith, we'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. Okie doke. This is interesting, and I'll vent on this in a second, but I just want to point out that there was a 19-minute executive session, which is, I believe, the longest we have ever seen under any case, any circumstance. So they are definitely looking into the records and trying to see, I guess, what really happened. I give them a lot of credit for that. Maybe they were also having lunch, but that's a different topic. Anyways, you think he's going to get revoked? I think they're going to take it easy. What do you think? Let's jump in. All right. We are uh, we are back in regular session, and thanks for your indulgence. We had to have time to review the documents. Uh, Mr. Smith, I mean, excuse me, Mr. Chasson, we are prepared to vote, and Mr. Freeman is going to be voting first. Okay, Mr. Chasson, you know, we're looking at the file, and, and I know there was a lot of stuff that went on between the probation officer, the lawyer, the judge. But the final thing the judge tells you is that these counts can be used against you for your revocation. That's the final thing he said. When he said that, uh, my head, your head should have picked up because you pled to some charges which we cannot ignore. Uh, they violent misdemeanors, and I, uh, I choose to revoke at this time. This is Mr. Chasson. Um... Looking at the total package of your time on supervision, um, I wasn't pleased with not seeing some things that you were mandated to do by the parole board. That's not the reason for my vote today, but I just want to make sure that you know that there were things you were supposed to be doing. But the um, police report um, gave me concrete evidence that um, that you have um violated your conditions my vote today is to be back all right uh mr chasson and i do concur with my colleagues based on the uh the information contained in the police report my vote today is to revoke your parole all right sir we wish you well we'll send you information on how you can uh, apply for re-parole and instructions on how to do that Well, what do you think? Do you think that uh, he really only started to take those programs because he knew about parole or because they weren't available? It was interesting to see that that's what Mr. Roche may have found consensus on, but Mr. Mirabella with the reference of sometimes you got to get hit over the head with the board uh, before you can start taking the programs. Um, I love that Mr. Mirabella had this case and it's so sad that he is not coming back uh, but we're still meeting new parole board members. And if you haven't met any of them yet, you're going to meet one now because guess who's back? He 
he is back. Um, now, this hearing that we just watched took place mid-2020, and he picked up a new charge as of September 9, 2023. Uh, it says domestic abuse, aggravated assault, possession of uh, narcotics, it looks like. So we're going to see him at a revocation hearing. Um, now, March 20th is when it took place, 2024, so let's jump in.